Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Manitoba Masonry Institute sponsor lecture. I am Carlos Rueda, Associate Professor in the Department of Architecture. I would like to begin acknowledging that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oje Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Metis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Now I welcome Peter Schuster, MMI Director of Business Development. Peter, this virtual floor is yours. Great, thank you, Carlos. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pete Schuster, and I'm the Director of Business Development for the Manitoba Masonry Institute. On behalf of the MMI, we are delighted to have everyone gathered safely together to enjoy our ongoing lecture series dedicated to the design community. In past years, we have, in conjunction with the Partners Program, presented a wide variety of topics in relation to design and our built environment. While we all look forward to a time soon when we'll be able to safely be together, we are fortunate to have the technology available to us to still gather as a community, learn something new, and carry it with us. The MMI would like to thank Adam for taking time from his schedule, especially considering the large time zone difference, and enlightening us on his chosen topic of why are we building. We would also like to take a moment to recognize the Faculty of Architecture students who have joined us today. We are happy that you have joined in on the program, knowing full well the mountain of work you have ahead of you this semester. Your hours are valuable, and we're glad that you've chosen to spend at least one of them with us. You have great cheerleaders for your growth and success who were instrumental in assembling us all together. So a big shout out to your professors, Neil Manuk and Carlos Rueda, as well as the partners program, Brandy O'Reilly and Aaron Rollock. You make putting together a program such as this seem real easy. We would also like to thank you, our valued designers for joining us on this occasion. And we look forward to being your trusted resource for masonry design information and partnership. We have a short video outlining some of the work that the MMI does on behalf of the Masons of Manitoba and in conjunction with design professionals of all disciplines. We'll then turn the program over to our good friends at the University of Manitoba to start the program. So enjoy everyone. At the Manitoba Masonry Institute, we are dedicated to developing the use of masonry and masonry products within the province. From full bed traditional masonry to adhered veneers of natural and manufactured stones and bricks, our mission is to meet the needs and requirements of designers, developers, builders, owners, educators, and government bodies in an ever-changing building environment. We partner with experts within the industry to provide fact and solution-based information to today's design challenges. To know more about how you can be a part of the MMI, get in touch with us today. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Greetings on behalf of the Partners Program and the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Manitoba. It is a privilege for me to have Adam Caruso today, as it is for all of us, for this Manitoba Masonry Institute sponsor lecture. With Adam, we have agreed to a rather short introduction to benefit from additional time for conversation, as Adam kindly suggested. Caruso St. John configure an exemplary practice career path, celebrating 30 years of meaningful projects, consistently elaborating on relevant disciplinary themes and achieving progressive success in the rich, complex and highly competitive European context. Their practice evidences an understanding of architecture as product and manifestation of high cultural thinking and making concerned with creative propositions that face a generalized contemporary crisis of what we may call historical consciousness. Adam Caruso studied architecture at Univers McGill University, then he moved to London and with Peter St. John, they oversee the work of Caruso St. John, two offices in London and Zurich. He's closely involved with all projects, public and commercial, including projects in UNESCO World Heritage Sites, and buildings of highest listing in the UK. Adam writes for international architecture publications and has authored and co-edited a number of books, including The Feeling of Things, Rudolf Schwartz and the Monumental Order of Things, As Nago Bender and the Construction of Modern Milan, The Stones of 
Fernand Pouillon, an alternative modernism in French architecture, and Hopkins in the city. Adam teaches in parallel with his practice and in 2011 was appointed Professor of Architecture and Construction at the ETH, Zurich. Without any further ado, I welcome him to our academic and professional community. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much, Carlos. And uh, thank you, Peter, also for the introduction. And um, thanks to everyone at the University of Manitoba. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carlos is going to confirm that everyone sees it. Perfect. Um, I see the screen. And I'll just go to, so it's full screen now, yeah? Yes. OK. I mean, why build? That's the title of my talk, but I'll, I'll save you from that title. You can remember it. Um, it's a slightly complex lecture I'm going to give. It has three parts. The first part is um, a statement of where I feel I am now. And um, I'm going to uh, read and comment on, on, on a few issues that I find to be really central uh, to the practice of architecture uh, in 2021. Uh, and I'm going to use a, some of my students' work to illustrate this part of the lecture. Then the second part of the lecture, I'm going to show two completed projects, one in London and one in Bremen. And then I'm going to finish by showing a project that we are built, currently building in Zurich. And I'll, I'll tell you why I'm showing that project uh, when I get to it. Okay, I'm gonna start. I mean, this is the new art gallery in Walsall, which we finished in 2000. It just um, celebrated its 20th anniversary. We had a party there just before COVID uh, became a big thing. Possibly that party was a bit of a spreader event, I don't know. Um, and it was the first substantial public building or substantial building that Peter and I did. Uh, we won a competition for it in 96. So Peter and I started our practice in 1990, as Carlos uh, intimated. So we've been in practice for 30 years, which is quite a bracing thought, makes me feel very old. Um, so we started our practice in 1990, and there was so much to fight for, high tech, deconstructivism, neo-modernism, all in their own ways, feeding on the indiscriminate fuel of the market economy, armed with Aldo Rossi and Robert Venturi's twin manifestos of 1966. And with the certainty of youth, Peter and I began our practice by declaring the autonomy of architecture, construction and spatial character, the discipline of architecture itself would be the means with which we would resist the corrosive forces of the late capitalist market. While laissez-faire postmodern times of our studies presented us with a diversity of choice, something that we both even today, not even, that we both today acknowledge was a kind of very lucky uh, a, a stroke of luck that we were educated in the late 70s, early 80s when Really architecture seemed, it seemed possible that architecture could be anything. But that openness also um, alerted us to the necessity uh, of exercising ethical judgment in our work. At the beginning of our practice, we were um, inspired by in what in Europe was referred to as critical practices, practices of people like Luigi Snozzi, Alvaro Siza, Roger Diener, and we believe that architecture could engage with and contribute to that most powerful embodiment of human endeavor, the European city. Um, early projects, competition entries, they were our training. They were our entry requirements that would permit us to engage in the concrete reality of the contemporary city and in modest ways contribute to its continuity. We were one of those practices, and even then, it wasn't so common, uh, who believed that an urban spirit still burned 
and that even in places like the center of Walsall, which uh, this is a photograph of with our art gallery in the center, that even places like the center of Walsall, architecture was capable of sustaining the qualities of a shared public life. So you could say the first 15 to 20 years of our practice, we did smaller projects. We were very lucky to start to do cultural projects, but we consistently did competitions and then started to be invited to do competitions for quite big urban buildings on important sites in European cities. So after Walsall, I'm just, this is part of a series of photographs that a friend of ours did. This is London and on the left-hand side, that's the is Newport Street Gallery, the gallery that we did for Damien Hirst, which I will talk more about later on. Our first commercial building, uh, which we finished in 2013 for the Swiss National Railway in the center of Zurich uh, on Europa Lay. It's, it's this building here. Um, the Bremer Landesbank, uh, which I'll talk about later, which we completed in 2016. And a more recent building that was finished a couple of years ago, also near the center of Zurich, this building here for the St. Jakob Stiftung, a foundation that provides employment for disabled people, a real, a new factory building in a previously industrial part of the city. So really all of that perseverance and seriousness and commitment to the city did pay dividends. And I can tell you in the last in the last 12 months, and let's say the next three or four months, we will finish eight major buildings in the center of European cities. So we have begun to make this contribution to the city that we dreamed about. But architects, unfortunately, are inveterate optimists. And unlike Karl Marx, we underestimate the insatiable appetites of capitalism. Architecture always has a perilous proximity to money, but occasionally there are situations where mitigating circumstances provide an insulating distance to the brutal forces of the market. It could be an enlightened client, a powerful city architect, a good competition jury. In the last 10 years, the in in inexhaustible dynamism of capitalism has reduced the capacity of these moderating forces overproduction of architecture as an instrument of investment, and that production's greedy consumption of finite resources has made architecture well and truly part of the problem. Aside from a history of urban utopias, the benevolent city hasn't really ever existed. Even the cities that we as architects and urbanists consistently cite as existing in some kind of social and formal state of grace, and I'm gonna go through a few of them in a moment, were not at the time of their conception anything like that. In the same way that the contemporary city is a perfect instrument for the forces of late capitalism, past cities were also instruments to sustain and advance the power of the vested interests that built them. If we try to read some of our favorite historical cities, this becomes all too clear, as does the stubborn capacity of stone, concrete, steel, and glass to advance and consolidate the interests of power. I'm just gonna show you four cities and I'm using quite amazing models that my students made a few years ago uh, in a semester that we called Metropolis where we looked at some examples of these great cities, cities that of course I still love to visit, uh, one of which London I live in. Uh, um, but, but if you really interrogate the origins of these cities and the way they worked as instruments, um, they are not so benevolent. So this is a, a model shot and some of these models are like four meters long. So everything is built and then they were photographed to make this kind of atmosphere. And each of the metropolises were of a particular place, but also time. So this is Regency London in around 1830, and it's showing um, John Nash's Regent Street. And of course, I always knew that George in London 
uh, was a developer city and that Nash was working for the crown and for other landed estates. Um, but I also always thought that the Georgian city was somehow a paradigm of a kind of moderated kind of formal reticence and that behind the rather consistent and at times, you know, and, and modernist architects thought they were rather dull. I think they're rather beautiful, but behind these largely brick and sometimes a stucco facades, uh, all sorts of things could happen. Uh, characters like Beau Brumel, the urban dandy emerged in Regency London and, and started to kind of enact uh, a kind of gendered uh, performative occupation of the city. Um, but really the idea of the ur urban dandy and the kind of social liberation that he represented uh, was only for the very, very privileged for less than the 1% in those days. Um, and that's indeed who this city was built for. Um, and if we think about Regency London in light of post-colonial discussions that are taking place today, uh, of course, the money to build this city, this city came from empire and the wealth of empire was built um, on slavery, you know? So what do we make of the city? <laughs> that, that was the kind of, those were the resources that this city as a kind of urban instrument were in, was enacting. And really London and the central parts of London have never really been popular in that they were accessible to a wide range of society. The only times they've been popular was when the center of the city was no longer attractive to the richer people in society. So the times like the 50s and 60s, where you had a kind of hollowing out of the city, most cities experienced this. That was the only time when these parts of the city actually became accessible to everyone. And I'm gonna to return to that theme in a moment. Another metropolis we looked at was Houseman's Paris. And this is a view from 1870, looking down uh, the Avenue de, de l'Opera, and you can see the Garnier Opera at the end of the street. There seems to be a little bit of dust on the street. Uh, there must have been <laughs> some, some difficult weather. I've always felt quite ambivalent about Paris. Of course, I love the consistency, the stone, the splendor of the inner arrondissement, uh, but I've also always found it a bit stifling, and I always uh, pity my colleagues who are architects in Paris rather than in London, which is a much uglier city, but uh, as a result of its ugliness seems to have much more potential. Um, but I don't have to describe to you, to architects, to students of architecture, how 19th century Paris was completely conceived of as a financial instrument. Haussmann's great project to rebuild uh, a modern Paris, and he, it was an incredibly successful uh, project, uh, was a major and first instance of leveraging the private sector to provide, um, to provide planning gain, if you will, uh, uh, in the construction of the modern city. So for the super profits that the developers who were collaborating on this project uh, would receive in return, they provided Haussmann and the city administration with wide boulevards, with contemporary sewage and other infrastructures, um, and with this kind of very hygienic and easy to defend city. Uh, a city which, and it's been you know, written about and talked about many, many times, a city which managed all too successfully to eliminate the marginal spaces uh, that the medieval city provided for the more marginal members of society. Uh, Paris was also at this time, of course, a, benef a beneficiary of empire and, that, and, and these vast amounts of money uh, came, were as ill-begotten as the capital that built Regency London. This is South State Street in Chicago in the end of the 19th century. Chicago is one of my favorite cities. Uh, Chicago never pretended to be anything other than a city about money. Every five to 10 years, every building more or less would be demolished because the fire codes would be changed, which would allow taller buildings to be built. The technology of caisson 
foundations of the steel frame of elevators, all of these things allowed five-story buildings to become 10-story buildings, to become 15-story buildings, to become 50-story buildings. So this is a kind of money being built uh, in front of our eyes. Um, so there's no kind of false pretense that it's anything but that. Nonetheless, there was somehow in the second half of the 19th century enough consensus amongst the politicians, the clients and the architects who were kind of collaborating in a way on this project. There was enough consensus to make a city that even today has an amazing coherence and still feels like an amazing um, place for people. And my last example it's, is Post Potsdamer Platz, just as uh, Berlin was becoming unified. And in the distance, we can see Hans Kohlhoff's first project for the Potsdamer Platz competition, an incredibly visionary uh, project, which didn't win, which was actually thrown out of the competition, but to me is a kind of perfect symbol of how uh, uh, the um, uh, accumulation of wealth, how the expression of ground as an asset that must be exploited rises out of the sand of the empty center of Berlin, a metropolis which was split after the war and with reunification could become a metropolis once again. And his project all too kind of vividly, but also I think in a poetic way, shows this kind of incredible concentration of floor space that just emerges out of a kind of desert of the um, hinterland that existed at the middle of the city. And in the foreground, we see the tent for the circus of um, Wim Wenders' Wings of Desire. We see a fragment of the wall on the right-hand side. We see uh, the building with the Daimler-Benz sign kind of rising up in the distance, uh, a kind of symbol of the Western part of the city. So that's a kind of very depressing tour of, of cities. I mean, I still love cities. Although I must say with the COVID, you start to question the, the, the experience of COVID, but also the effect that COVID, the way it speeded up the kind of end of retail, one does start to wonder about what the future of cities are. But anyway, now I'm going to have a slightly more positive take on the city. So this is a photograph from 1971 of um, Carol Gooden, Tina Girward, and Gordon Maddock Clark outside Food, this amazing artist-run restaurant that they, uh, they built, but they also ran at 127 Princess Street in New York. Uh, in New York, when it was really heading for, um, for bankruptcy, uh, but which I argue was really quite a, 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 a fertile time for cities. So urban territories are not always simply financial asset classes and cities are not always such an attractive prospect. The 1970s were dirtier, noisier and poorer than today. In London, this was a time of the three day week and striking miners and garbage strikes. New York was also in decline, dangerous, and in 1975, in the brink of bankruptcy. Zurich's Niederdorf, with its cheap rents and undyed charm, was a magnet for Zurich's Bohemian Society, for students, for artists, for the emerging gay scene, for the marginal, recreational, and not, not always legal activities of the city. Pre-unification West Berlin was, others, was another such place, full of diversity, promise, and invention, just not necessarily of a financial kind. It's apparent that the post-war social democratic consensus in these places was coming to an end. And yet, as crisis followed crisis, a crack within the inexorable progress of capitalism created a space for productive idealism to flower, one that was emancipatory and that worked in a light and provisional way. Out of the hedonism of the 1960s emerged feminism, gay rights, and environmentalism, taking root in the empty spaces 
and under-occupied buildings of the inner city. Squatting became a social movement as well as a way to live cheaply. New kinds of citizens not only repaired the decaying building stock, but also brought life back into the empty shell of the city, forming communes and other kinds of experimental households. Existence wasn't defined by work and by earnings, but instead by the balance and the artistry that one brought to living and the way in which individual lives enriched the neighborhood and society. Gordon Maddox Clark's Walls paper from 1972 shows the crumbling buildings of Soho in a way that exposes the physical residue and her human stories of the city. There he is in 112 Green Street installing this beautiful project. Martha, Martha Rossler's The Bowery and Two Inadequate Descriptive Systems of 1975 transforms the abject poverty of those at the edges of society into a black humor worthy of Samuel Beckett. Rossler has subsequently written about the artist's complicity through gentrification in the commodification of property. But for a decade, artists working in this kind of urban ground zero refused to give up either in the city or its people. This was a time when small alternative communities took advantage of the frequently selfish freedoms of the 60s to develop something more coherent and substantial. A second phase of modernism that was no longer reliant on post-war positivism and the state, but had not yet succumbed to a neoliberal consumerism. So this second phase of modernism is something that over the last two years I've been looking at uh, very closely with my students and really trying to make some sense about how we can take up these narratives and how we can kind of revalidate, uh, make relevant again an idea of modernism. Uh, this interest in modernism coincides with the realization also that postmodernism was um, irredeemable. I mean, for a long time, Peter and I would say that we practiced a postmodern architecture. We said it a little bit to provoke people, but I, we also thought that that was possible. But actually, I don't feel that's possible. So I'm going to show a couple of students' projects in a second, but I'll just finish this text. The evident failure of architecture to address the imbalances of contemporary life has motivated me to look again in practice and with my students, the ETH, at the more ideological and programmatic promises of modernism. It's easy, for, it's easy to forget that modernism not only supplied the forms for a future that would never arrive, it was also like a fresh breeze, blowing away the crippling historical weight of the Ancien Regime. It was the first movement that gave expression and dignity to the desires of the many, and not just to an elite. If everyday life was and still is fragile, could the delicate responsiveness possible within modernism be its spatial counterpoint? The second wave of modernism of the 60s and 70s broadened its discourses to encompass themes of gender, the legacies of empire and the environment. We are looking at how these themes of emancipation and responsibility can form the basis for new architectures. Artists like Martha Rossler and Matt Gordon Maddox Clark, whose work exploited, exploited a derelict 1970s downtown New York, provides the means to critically engage with the city around us. More contemporary figures, uh, amongst which uh, people like Andrew Frazier, Taryn Simon, Pierre Huig, expand the reach and the mechanisms of that earlier work to more closely trace the situation today. A consumer driven economy and its insatiable consumption of precious resources is neither desirable nor sustainable. Instead, we need to shift our attention to the things that give us purpose and happiness. What should we be doing? How can we have fulfilling lives? I'm going to briefly show you a couple of projects uh, that are from two semesters ago. 
we have a revamped website for our chair, for my chair at the ETH. And all of these projects are there, including the films, which I would have liked to show you, but they're, they're not long, but they're a bit too long for today. So this was a project called the Whole Mag Catalog, which is a kind of riff and an updating on the whole Earth catalog in the Mag area, which is a very concentrated area of um, new development in the ex-industrial area of Zurich West and Zurich. And this is a picture of one of the towers. And um, this group did a manifesto, which is in this whole mag catalog, and uh, where I'll just do a few highlights of it. What I really like about this frontis page is at the bottom over here, they say the authors are convinced of their instructions and guarantee benefits. However, they are not liable for failure. I mean, another thing I've been trying to achieve and encourage with my students is that glorious failure is often preferable to safe success. Um, and I encourage them to take that risk um, to fail. And anyways, what does failure mean? So this project looked, first of all, the artists that they were using as a kind of instrument was um, um, Cindy Sherman, and they made a really hilarious film that was based on interviews of people who worked and lived in the Mag area, which you can see behind all of the characters. So the four people in the group dressed up at the as the different characters that they'd met, and there were subtitles that were quoting from the um, social scientific interviews that they'd done in the area. And then the group of four split into two, and two of the students, uh, Livia Tefeda and Natalie Clack, made this project, the whole MAG catalog where they dissected um, the tower that stands to the side of the Mag Ariel, and they showed how the individual apartments and the individual laundry facilities and the individual kitchens, how all of these things could be made into a collective resource and the great benefit that would happen if you thought about the whole building with its 120 apartments as a collective resource, as a way of breaking the cycle of consumerism, but also as a social instrument, as a helping instrument, and as an instrument that would encourage wellness. I'm not gonna go through it in any detail, but mottos or, yeah, mottos like, sharing is the new luxury rather than a compromise. Um, uh, this, they, they, they set up a kind of library in the building where all of the extra domestic appliances that people had would be stored, and so you wouldn't, have to when you found you didn't have the right blender or the right attachment for your Cuisinart, you wouldn't have to buy your own. You would go down there, you would look on the online catalog and you could just borrow it. Also quite funny things like that on Friday nights, the lifts became different kinds of chill out zones uh, and you could, you could hang out in the lifts. Another project, uh, a kind of much more difficult and less didactic one, but also a really beautiful project, which was using the work of Pierre Huyg and the idea of informal ceremony is this project, uh, which was called Die Mysterie vom Viri, which was by three students, Giuseppe Allegri, Michael Nelson, and Frederick Mürst. And they, their site was a Langstrasse, which is the long street in the middle of Zurich, and it's the red light district, but it's being extensively gentrified. And th this semester happened during lockdown and they did extensive interviews before lockdown with the old characters of Langstrasse, of people on the margins of society who had like very happy people who came out of the punk scene in the late seventies, who were involved with drugs, pornography, things like that, but actually who now are sometimes art collectors or who were the first accountants for artists who are today famous. And they tried to make a mystery, like a religious mystery about Landstrasse past and present. And some of them were very sweet and kind of slightly creepy views of the street itself, like this maypole. But most of the spaces they made were in their flat. So this is a kind of amazing laundromat where you can see it's made with a pizza box and a bit of lighting and, and a cutout and some carpet in the foreground, which has a giant scale. And then 
one of the washing machines in their apartment or downstairs in the common uh, washing area becomes a kind of weird nighttime space, maybe a disco or a techno club. Yep, uh, a kind of window uh, into, into, into uh, one of the interiors of Langstrasse. A kind of weird cistern underground space. And then a famous uh, uh, sausage stand, uh, which suffered a kind of catastrophic fire, which was part of the actual history of the street. Okay, so now I'm gonna start the second part of my lecture. So I'm gonna start by showing uh, a project that we finished in 2016 for the Bremer Landesbank, which is in the middle, Bremen is a, city in Northern Germany, it's a free port. It's part of the Hanseatic, it was part of the Hanseatic League. It's a very important medieval town. And Hanseatic also means it has this shared brick tradition with the other Hanseatic cities like, Ham, like Hamburg or Lübeck and even London, which was, was a Hanseatic port as well. So we were invited to do this competition. We were the only foreign practice, all the other practices were German. And it's in a space called the Domshof, which you're looking at here. This is our building. We were replacing a 1980s building, which really was a bad building. It didn't work. So that's why it was being replaced. The big site with its three spaces is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The cathedral is here. The town hall is here. There's another medieval church here. Uh, there's the Domshof, the cathedral square, there's a flower market, and then there's a, another market uh, around the town hall. So it's an incredibly historically charged site. Um, and we, Peter and I, had Hanseatic architecture on our mind and things like this. This is a building by Hans Pulzig from the 1920s in Hanover, very ordinary office and warehouse building. Uh, which actually still exists, we found, found it, but this is a photograph from the 20s. So this idea of a textile architecture using brick, an architecture that actually has two origins. One is British arts and crafts architecture. Uh, arts and crafts architecture was really the only time British architecture was leading the world in the late 19th century. But it also, it's a kind of hybrid of arts and crafts architecture in a North German version of American architecture, uh, especially when Fritz Schumacher was the city architect of Hamburg and building the big buildings of the Konterhäuser like Chili House, etc. So we were thinking about that. You don't talk about Hamburg when you're working in Bremen, though, because they're rivals, they're not friends, even though it's, you know, it's an hour on the train. Um, so we're in this highly charged uh, situation on the square. There are two existing facades from the original uh, over here on this lower part of the plan of the original headquarters building from the end of the 19th century and from a 1930s existence with uh, addition, which were already incorporated into the 1980s building. So these facades had to be incorporated, uh, but our plan is a kind of unifying element. So we have this oval courtyard at the center of the plan, which is publicly accessible through a porte cochere plan you can see, especially the upper level plans, we were very inspired. We were referencing Sigurd Leverance's social security office in the center of, um, of Stockholm. But the courtyard is publicly accessible and the office entrance is through the courtyard. And on the Domshof is a banking hall, which is public. Uh, and an entrance to the private banking, which is for high worth customers. And then there's retail along the back. So very detailed German program, uh, uh, desk space for about 450 people, a small trading floor, executive offices, et cetera, et cetera. Very detailed brief. And we came up with this project. This is a drawing that we did. We did a drawing like this for the competition, but this is a, new, a drawing that we made when the building was fully resolved. These are the plan. Uh, plan details of the facade, and this is the facade. So there were 
10 architects invited for this competition. We were the only non-German architects. We were the only architects to propose a brick building in a city which is built almost entirely of brick. Uh, all of the German architects proposed concrete buildings, um, much more modern buildings. There was a very, very good jury for us. And at the time, Bremen had an excellent city architect who subsequently moved on to, to Cologne and to Hamburg. And we have won competitions in both of those cities when he's been city architect. Uh, his name is Dr. Hoeing. So we really made a building that was about Hanseatic brick architecture, but it was also about being on this, this cathedral square, taking its place next to the other monumental buildings of the square, a building that also should express something about what a bank headquarters should be, that it should be secure um, there for the long term. But you could also imagine that this building, its facade, its morphology with its courtyard, the simple plans could also outlive its use as a bank headquarters and it could be useful into the future. I mean, if one is building on a site like this really there doesn't seem to be a lot of benefit of building a building that will be demolished after 20 years like the former building was. There's a big arch on the corner, uh, which is the entrance to the banking hall, a smaller opening here that gives access to the underground car park and to a public toilet, which we had to incorporate. And the building up to the cornice line of the neighbors is made of brick, which is standing on its own foundation uh, on, on the line of the facade. So it's, it's holding its own weight. It's a self-bearing brick facade. I mean, it took more several years to develop this facade. It's very complex. You can see how the piers get thinner as you get to the top. In the roof, where the roof would normally be, we change from brick to terracotta. And the terracotta is demonstrably hung. So it's a lighter material and it's setting back. But this brick is very complex. Uh, there are six different bricks, and the bricks were made, as is the custom in northern Germany, by a local brick maker who made three special, uh, six special bricks for the project. So this is a bit closer up. You can see most of the bricks are a kind of dark brown, and then there's a greenish brick uh, which is woven into these intermediate piers. The big arch to get into the banking hall, but also to get into the port cocher, which I'll show you in a moment, is self-bearing. So it was built with timber false works. You can still do this in Germany. You can still do it in Britain. I mean, I, I'm not sure if you can do it in Canada. And it's, I know it's, a, it's a, one of the privileges of working uh, in Europe, in most European countries. The budget for the overall building was quite a middle level budget. But clearly the budget for the facade was more than mid-level. It was a good budget, but because we won the competition, because the historic conservation, uh, the main, the director of historic conversation was on the jury and supported the project, the, the quality of the facade was never really challenged by the, uh, by the client. So this is a detail. You can see the different bricks. So there's six different bricks. Um, but actually the bricks are not expressing that they're holding themselves up because these bays that are projecting to make the spandrels of the windows, there's a precast unit there. These are actually tiles which are glued onto the unit and then that precast unit is holding those bricks. And then the sill is made of a cast aluminium. And here you can see these kind of woven bricks. This is the side street where the flower market is, and this is the port cochere, which gives access to the court. And here you can see the facade of the um, original headquarters building, and you can see that we replaced the roof. And we made these giant sized dormers so that the office space can have continuity between the new building and the new and the old one. This is the entrance into the courtyard with this kind of baldacchino, which signals the entrance, the office entrance for the staff. And then the courtyard has three ginkgo trees and a continuous precast concrete bench where people come and eat their lunch um, during the week. 
And uh, on the weekends, there are sometimes concerts here. Um, and occasionally the market goes into this space as well. It has gates, so at I think nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, the court is closed. So this is the archway into the banking hall. I mean, obviously these bricklayers were very skilled bricklayers. Um, in the banking hall, which is entirely lined in white glazed tiles, the terrazzo floor with all of this furniture in leather and in walnut, which we uh, designed. And then looking the other way where the arch of course is not negotiating a very, very deep wall, but it kind of comes in like a kind of elephant's trunk into the space. Quite difficult geometrically to resolve, <laughs> but it's built. Okay, so that's the first project. And then the second project I'm gonna show that's built uh, is the project we did for a uh, Damien Hurst uh, in South London called Newport Street Gallery, which is also in brick. And I'll talk about that and why it's so different. But this is a photograph that Peter and I took in the early 90s when we started our project and where when London, especially the east part of London where we had our office was rather derelict. And there were many buildings like this one. This was a distillery building in Clerkenwell on the edge of the city. It's subsequently been renovated and there's actually a big commercial architecture firm who uses it now, BDP. But we used to love buildings like this, buildings that were obviously added to over time, but because of a kind of consistent technique being used, a more or less consistent material, brick, albeit not the same color, that all together, all of the additions, all of the history of these buildings came together to make a kind of a whole which nonetheless had a very strong identity, but not an identity that relied on kind of symmetry, let's say, or a kind of uh, obvious geometric um, geometries which would bind it together. Rather, they had an identity that was more to do with their atmosphere, more to do with their awkwardness. It was something that we really enjoyed and something we sought out. And we took many, many photographs like this, and it was this kind of series, um, influenced by photographers like Thomas Strutt and Candida Hoffer, who we were very influenced by, and really trying to make a picture of our London, the London of the early 90s when we started our practice. So this is a photograph uh, from a tall building of Newport Street, so that's it. And you can see it has obvious, the kind of conglomerate of existing and new buildings have off, has an obvious connection to that. That's the city of London the Shard and Southwark and beyond Canary Wharf. So we're quite far away from it. The river is over here and across the river is Tate Britain, which is another project that we were doing almost at the same time, but I'm not gonna show you. This is a project we worked on for 12 years. Damien Hurst was very involved in it. Um, and it's a building where at the center, it's a whole block. And at the center of the block are three historic monuments. They were built in the end of the 19th century as scenery painting workshops. So workshops where they would paint the sceneries for West End Theater. They've been disused since the 70s and the building was derelict. At this end, there was a one-story shed, which we demolished. And at the other side, there was a building from the 50s, which we also demolished. So there's an existing building in the middle and then two new buildings. And together, the idea is that they make a single new whole in the same way as I described the distillery building in Clerkenwell. This is a model that we worked used during the whole course of the project where you see the building. So we removed the structures of the scenery painting workshop. Scenery painting workshops don't have floors, they just have scaffolds in them. And we made a new floor at ground level. You enter on the left and then there is three public stairs and then a private stair, which give you access to a top level and that's the museum. And then there's an intermediate level in the first building where there's a restaurant. And then in the building on the right-hand side, there's offices, a shop and viewing rooms in the top. Um, and those floors are all new and they're concrete in a steel structure. So here's a plan of the ground floor. 
And you could see, so these, this brick is all existing, but we needed to pencil, kind of to pin into the brickwork steel because the load capacity that we needed for the gallery space, especially since Damien Hirst wanted to be able to, the museum is to show Damien Hirst's collection, not his art, not the art he makes. He has a collection of over 3000 works, an incredible collection that ranges from Baroque painting to Francis Bacon, to Jeff Koons, to Victorian curios. But he wanted to also maybe be able to show his work and his big tanks weigh 75 tons. So the load capacity of these floors has to be 25 kilonewtons per meter squared, which is twice the load capacity of the galleries of Tate Modern. So we needed to reinforce the existing walls in order to achieve that. So in the existing building, we have brick walls which are existing, which are holding their own weight. And on the interior, we're adding a steel vertical structure which then holds horizontal steel and concrete structure to achieve this load capacity we need. In the new buildings on the right and on the left-hand side, we have a steel building with concrete infill for the, for the walls, but we build a new full brick wall as well around that, and that brick is holding itself up. So why did we do that? We did it because we wanted the new and the old buildings, the tech the technique of their construction to have a relationship to each other, but we also wanted the new brick walls not to require silicon joints every six meters according to the code. And by making the bricks, the brick walls full bricks, by using um, lime mortars, which are softer than cement mortars, we were able to avoid silicon joints. So there is a silicon joint between the new and the old brick wall, but then for the new brick walls, they are continuous. And where we're worried there might be some um, movement, we have uh, bed joint reinforcement in steel. And the new stairs, which you see here, here, and here, they are completely brick structures. So there on the inside, it's also brick. And I'll show you them. Very, very, and because they're oval, they're very challenging. So in some ways, the brickwork in this building is as challenging as it was in Bremen. Um, but you'll see that in its appearance, it's very different. The old buildings were built with the lousiest bricks you can imagine. They were built by the bricks that were available by the brick merchants who would go up and down the canals of London and sell their bricks at the end of every week. So the existing buildings have four distinct different bricks. You can see there's a better brick over the arches, there's a harder brick on the sill, but then the general walls are just a kind of combination of really quite shit bricks. So for the new building, we developed a new brick. It's not such an expensive brick. We worked with a brick maker. We used a technique that was used in the Victorian time. So this is the basic brick. And then during we experimented with different firings to get a kind of an, ass an assortment that had something to do with the old brickwork in the new bricks. And then to make this dark base, um, we put salts on the bricks before they were fired in the kiln. And that's a kind of technique that was used in Victorian times. It's a cheap way of making uh, brick dark. And that's what we did here. So here you can see the full range of the buildings. And if you squint, they kind of fit together. You can also see though that we're not making any expression of the uh, weight bearing role of the brickwork. So the openings here, you can see there's a, just a single brick above the openings and that is tied back to a steel beam, which is uh, above the opening. So it's not, we're not trying to make a didactic brickwork, which is showing the way it's hold, held, the way a con building, let's say, would work. But we are using, it's the first time we used an English bond. So the way the full brick work, the full brick wall is held together is the same as it's held together in the existing wall. A very late addition was this enormous jumbotron screen in the middle building, which then has video and uh, and images that are to do with the ex current exhibition. So this is when uh, the Jeff Koons show was on a couple of years ago. 
quite fantastic. This is the view from the top of the tracks, the back, and then the spaces. So most of the galleries are in existing spaces. At the beginning of our design, these spaces were much rougher, but actually Damien Hirst didn't want them to be so rough, so we cleaned them up. But what he totally understood was that the geometry of these spaces should still recognize that they're in an existing building. So build, the galleries are not rectangular. They have the kind of kinks and bends of the existing building. This is the ground floor galleries, which are eight meters high. And then the upper galleries, which have amazing roof light, which are four and a half meters high. This is in the existing building. And then the gallery in the new building, which has this sawtooth north lights and one south light at the end. And then the stairs. The stairs are really the elements which raise the industrial building to being a public building. So they're made with kind of incredible care. They're still in brick, but the kind of complexity and even the difficulty of them, I think, is sort of evident. So the geometry, first of all, is quite complex. But there's also details like this precast concrete rail, which is built into the brick. The, remember, the, 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 the stairs are elliptical. And this is also then curved. So the Rhino models that we were making went directly to the precaster, who then had to make uh, molds from the rhino models and then cast the concrete. Every one of these is different. And they have to be built as the wall is rising because they're part of the structure of the wall. There was one point where even I, and I'm the guy in the practice who always pushes things to the very edge, I thought, this is really too difficult. You know, let's just tell Damien we can do it just as good a railing that is not so difficult. But he loved the way that this railing was built in and he loved the difficulty. It. So his response was, no, 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 come on, don't give up so easily. So he rented a warehouse uh, a few blocks away and we built one floor of the stair with the precast, with the masons who eventually built the, the, the brick. And, and actually it wasn't so difficult. The stair is an engineered timber stair we did a, a global search for who could make it. There were only three companies in the world who could make it. In the end, we tendered to a Swiss company and a German company, and the German company won, Deutsche Werkstatt Hellerau. The, but the stairs were built in Hellerau. Then they were disassembled into three pieces, brought to Britain, and reassembled on the site with kind of zero tolerance. And then this is at the top, and you can see this theme of the brick being a kind of atmospheric rather than a didactic element. You can see that the brick is also on the ceiling. Clearly, it's not spanning. The ceiling of these spaces are made in precast, and the brick is glued onto the precast and then sits on the walls, which are structural. So there's no distinction made between things that are structural and things that are not structural. And you can see how the lighting is built into the bricks, everything. This was a project where we had really a budget to do everything properly. And then the final space at the top of the building, which is actually Damien Hurst's office and a kind of private viewing room that looks out over the railway tracks and west over London. Okay, the last project I'm gonna show you is a project that we've been working on since 2012. So for eight years, it's going to be finished in 2022 and it's for uh, Zurich's hockey arena. I thought I'm giving a lecture in Winnipeg. I have to show you there our hockey project. Um, so unlike I imagine what would happen in North America, certainly what would happen in Britain, in Switzerland, if there's a, a, a competition for a football stadium or for a arena, um, the competition will have good architects on the jury and they will pick the best architects uh, in their, who are in their opinion, the best architects to be shortlisted for the competition. And being the best architect doesn't necessarily mean you've done a stadium before. We hadn't done a stadium. Actually, my partner in Switzerland worked for several years on the football stadium that didn't happen in hard term. So he had some experience, um, but we were shortlisted for the competition. I think 12 people were shortlisted and we won. The site is really the last site 
of the city proper in Altstetten. And our, our, the idea that we had for the competition was that instead of the arena being a shed, like our typical sports building, which is cheap on the outside and does what it needs to on the inside, that really being on this important site on the edge of the city, a very visible site when you go into Zurich on the train or in the motorway, that it should be a civic building. And these two first images are reference images that we showed in our competition entry. So the first one is the summer palace for the Swedish royal family in Drottningholm, outside of Stockholm. It's from the late 18th century, this amazing tent city where the tents are made of painted cast iron. So we thought, so this is a kind of monumental architecture, but which has a lightness of a literal lightness of weight, but also it has a lightness of spirit, which we were interested in. Another image that we showed was this, which is the Abu Dulof Mosque in Samara from the ninth century. And what we were interested in is that you could make a sports building that was really architecture, where the structure and the relationship of the spaces and the structure had the kind of purposefulness that this incredible plan of this very early mosque built in the desert had. Um, so those were two of our references. And this is a view, these renderings are of a later stage of the project, but this is a view from the Europa Bridge, which is a bridge. So we're looking towards the center of Zurich. This is Altstetten. There's lots of new financial services buildings in this area. There's an S-Bahn station, so it takes about four minutes from the center of Zurich. There's a tram as well. We're just doing a study for UBS right near here for two towers. Um, and this is the building, this kind of, it's not literally tent-like, but the facades have a textile quality, which is a bit like drapery, but it's also a bit like fluting of a classical building. And there's also this profile, kind of profile where the tall part is clearly holding the main arena. Um, so the, I'll, I'll go through the plans in a moment, but the contents are the main arena is a 12,000 seat arena for the um, Zurich Sporting Club's Lions, who typically are the best team in the Swiss League. The problem with the Swiss League is, I think it's like the fourth best league in the world now, but the problem is that the best players, of course, leave to go to the NHL. It's a kind of, so it doesn't have a lot of stability in terms of players. On the south of the building, there's this terrace, which has a big outdoor spare up to it, which is also gives access to the upper level of the bleachers. And this is a big terrace where you can go out during intermission, you can have a beer or a smoke, you can look out to the city, but it also is a space which could be rented out for car shows, etc. And then on the other side, instead of the terrace, there's a secondary rink for practice rink. The Lions are a full team that have 800 youth um, men and women youth players at every league level. And at the moment, their operation is completely spread out in the Zurich area. And this building is a way of them consolidating all of that. Anyway, I'm going to go through it in some detail. And you can see along the east and west where the entrances are, there's two arcades, which are also kind of part of giving a civic um, quality to this sports building. So this is the plan. This is the railway tracks, and it's really the mega railway track going in and out of um, Zurich in the direction of Baden. This is the motorway. And then the river is just beyond that, the Glatt, or not the Limat, rather. These are these office buildings I was talking about, but then this is the edge of the city and beyond there are um, allotment gardens. So it's gardens and sports fields, etc. And that will remain green. So there's actually a very beautiful environment around the building. I'm going to go through the plants very quickly. So this is the ground floor. You see these arcades, which give you access directly into the ground, the lower level of the foyers, but also to these stairs, which go up to this upper terrace. There's parking only for employees and VIPs and players. Everyone else comes with public transport. And this is the dressing rooms. 
and yeah, different dressing rooms. And this is the kind of sports um, restaurant, which is open uh, not only during matches. This is the next floor where we can see the practice rink, which is at a level above. And you can see the lower part of the main, uh, the main rink has kind of sy symmetrical seating. And then as you go up, um, the seating builds up on one side. And then on the other side, you have the, build, the, the business club and the VIPs and the broadcasting, etc. And you can see that here where the business club is, there's a truss structure, which is the spanning structure over the practice rink. And I'll show you some sections in a sec. So that's the section you see this asymmetry. So the lower part is symmetrical. And then it goes up on one side. And then on the other side, you have the business club, the boxes, the broadcasting, and the offices for the club. And these big scoops, which you'll see later on, are scoops in the inner room, which allow natural light in during the day and have artificial lighting in the night. This is the terrace. Yeah. There's the practice rink. There's the stairs up to the terrace with the facade. The practice rink with the structure above it with the business club in it. The other section with these scoops. That's the looking at the business club and the press and the view from the tracks again. So when we won the competition, the idea was that the structure would be concrete and the cladding would be precast. Um, because the quality of facade that we wanted, it seemed that precast was the reasonable way to go. About a year, two years into the development, for all sorts of reasons, for money reasons, but also it's this is a Minergi building, so it's like Briam, it's not Briam or Lead, it's a kind of energy sustainable building, despite the fact it's an in situ concrete, which does, you know, feel a little bit like uh, kind of it's from the time we designed it. We eliminated the outer layer of precast and we made a decision to do the whole building in in situ so that the facades, rather than being cladding, they became structure, they became load bearing and part of the structure. Because the big room is a ice rink and doesn't need to be so heavily insulated, you don't want to insulate it too heavily because of the way the ice surface works and the, the way the different surfaces work. Um, it worked uh, to have a certain degree of thermal bridging. And in other areas where we need fully insulated uh, spaces, we do it with some thermal breaking in the slabs and insulation on the inside. Um, so we, were, we put that to the client, obviously, because there's quite a risk in doing the facades in in situ in terms of quality, but also in terms of the critical path during the construction, but they went for it. And it saved, I think, three or four million Swiss francs. Swiss francs about the same as a dollar, I think, a Canadian dollar. Um, and it, for us, it became much more exciting. It also meant that very few main contractors could do this concrete work. So I'll show you in a moment the prototyping uh, regime we went through and it was done with a company called Marty who were then named in the tender. So they're building it. So this is the view and you can see there's this sort of woven facade on the short ends which are 85 meters, no, they're 120 meters long. And then the long facades have these big fluted scallops and they're about 160 meters long. This is the arcade, a rendering obviously of the arcade with precast concrete to so the in situ, the in situ facade hanging down. There's a lot of circles in this building and here there are these round black tiles lining this facade, which obviously bear more than a passing resemblance to hockey pucks. They are the size of hockey pucks. This is the foyer space on the lower level with the ways up into the rink. This is the terrace and the ways up into the upper terrace. This is this, these, um, 
big roofs, I'll show you because one of them is the structure has been built that are on either end, which kind of cover you if it's raining or if it's very sunny. And this is the balustrade with the bench uh, around the stair that goes up to the space. Here's the rink, which is entirely in concrete because clearly the concrete is the inner and the outer wall, the scoops. And then the spanning structure is a two-way steel structure. That's the, um, the, the boxes, the business club, the press and the offices for the club. And then looking in the other direction where the bleachers go up during a kind of game, game time. Then a detail. I mean, the services coordination is obviously incredible. In Switzerland, we use for the uh, air, we use these things called monoblocks, which are combined systems. And there's, uh, there's 30 or 40 monoblocks in this building. Obviously, there's huge volumes of air that have to be moved around. And then this is the site a few months ago. So you can see the quality of the concrete on the inside, uh, looking towards the business club and the boxes with all of the molds for the shuttering on the floor waiting to be reused. And then a little bit about the facade. So this is the long facade with these scallops and what we were thinking of were uh, capitals, uh, columns with their fluting in a, in, a, in a classical temple. It's a very beautiful essay by somebody that I know who wrote about the geometry fluting and the way the flutes make the column feel more precise because they push the shadow to sharp moments. And so we were looking at that when we developed these flutes. More detail here, you can see the structure. So the inner wall, this is where the scoop is. This zone acts as a kind of buttress, which is stabilizing the loads from the uh, spanning structure of the roof, the facade the precast column that you saw in the rendering and the, and the facade. Uh, yeah, the way the, all of the reinforcement and the way these things are made. I'm not gonna go into that into detail. And then the end facades, which are more woven, a kind of more elaborate drapery. And we were looking at how would these folds work? How would the bottom of the folds work? Again, this is a facade that was developed over a number of years. We were looking at things like this, Schinkel's beautiful room for Princess Louisa and Charlottenburg, it's incredible swags of fabric, uh, a, a drawing from our Rhino model, quite laid on obviously. And then how did we develop this? We did many, many versions of the bottom. I remember telling the team who were a bit incredulous to look at these um, etchings by Flaxman, the classical sculptor. And you see how these draperies resolve themselves at the bottom. So that's what we did. So that's what it's like. So then the Rhino model was used to drive a CNC miller and we made uh, bigger and bigger models out of styrofoam. And then we started a, a, a series of prototypes. Oh, no, for, so this is about the shuttering. So at the beginning, so obviously all of the concrete is made with rubber molds. The rubber molds are made by a company called Reckli, who are in Germany. There's two companies, they're both German. Who Actually, it's not Reckli, it's the other company. They're both in Germany. And of course, we wanted to reduce the number of molds. So at the beginning of the development of the detailed design of the facade, I think we had over 100 different molds. And I think now we have 50. The different molds can be used a different number of times I think in the end, there are thousands of molds required for the uh, formation of the concrete. So these different colors are different molds. It's one facade. So this is the first mold we made for the first prototype, which was a three meter high prototype. There's the mold in the shutter and there's the prototype. We're using it's, it's, it's a, the simplest form of white cement. So it's white cement, but we're not using uh, white aggregate. So the, the, the surface is just as struck, there's no blasting, and the holes for the tiebacks and everything are done as part of the concrete repair, which is a very developed part of how you make concrete 
in Switzerland. And then the whole of the concrete, which you always do in Switzerland, is coated with a um, hyperforbeeren. It's a kind of um, semi-permeable waterproof layer, which works as an anti-graffiti layer, but also um, protects the surface. You do it for stone buildings as well. You pr it protects the surface against environmental pollution uh, attack from, from acid and things like that. Then the subcontractor wanted to do a 13 meter high prototype because they were worried about, because 13 meters is a single lift and they wanted to see, no, I think eight meters is a single lift up to here. And they wanted to see how the day work joint would be, um, how it would work when they did the bottom casting and then the upper one. They were worried about that the vertical plane of the concrete would, whether or not it would be good enough. So they did this sample. It was even better than the three meter high one. So they were, it was confident. And they've been on site for the last 18 months. So I'm gonna show you a few photographs from maybe two months ago. So this is the arcade. This is the view of the arcade from outside and you can see the scalloping. This is one of the end facades with the logo of the lions. This is a piece of precast which was made on the ground, then placed in here, and then the facade was cast around it. So it's in concrete. Um, and actually these windows are now in place. The way up to the upper platform, the upper terrace. So you can see how this really feels like a drapery which is drooping between the columns, but it's also spanning. The columns will, everything will be cleaned, obviously. The view uh, uh, of the terrace looking back at the building at the entrances to the upper foyer. And the structure for one of these canopies on the foyer, which also were precast on site and then lifted into place. They were too big to transport to the site, so they were precast on the site in a dark concrete. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Carlos? Thank you, Adam. It's <laughs> impressive, this beautiful work, needless to say. Um, I particularly feel uh, identified with uh, the capacity that, uh, that the architect, you, you as an architect, has to connect social, cultural, historical ideas with, with techniques and material forms. And, 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 and I think it speaks very well about what is our métier, you know, our, our or craft or uh, what is that architecture is about. Uh, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, I would like to give room to some questions. We have already some here. I have yeah. others, but I will, if, if we have time, we'll, we'll discuss them. Otherwise we'll leave them for later. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have a question for, uh, from Sasa Radulovic uh, from our uh, local uh, excellent firm uh, 546. And uh, that's, that's how we nickname <laughs> them dearly. And Sasa, uh, in a sort of an introduction, I'm going to read, he says, in a very eloquent introduction to your lecture concerning economics, instruments that included slavery and advantages that uh, advanced societies took over those less privileged at the time, you anchor practice of architecture as one that is not populist and that is uh, for the less than 1% of the population. You continue on a legacy of cities that were built and created at the time. At that time, in contrast to postmodern deconstructivist and high-tech uh, and situated uh, your practice in a sort of uh, revolt uh, to the ideas that these reactionary movements uh, promoted. And now onto uh, part two question, Today, you practice architecture defined by substance, but also a, a sobriety in the most dedicated, intelligent, and diligent of ways. 
in the space and time continuum. I am wondering where you see your work and then where you see architecture as a profession when it comes to serving the needs, aesthetic, and social, and physical of the 99%. Yeah. Um, it's a good question, but also quite difficult to answer. But I'll try and answer a little bit of it. I mean, I think your reading of what I said, I agree with. And there's a hopefully not a hypocrisy, but at least a kind of uh, uh, there's a slight disconnect in what I said at the beginning and then the work I show. I mean, you know, we work for good clients. It's true. We've done a lot of public buildings, though. I didn't, I mean, I, I showed what I showed because I, I didn't want to show lots of projects. I wanted to show a few in detail. You could say hockey is an incredibly popular sport in Switzerland. And um, it's also a lot cheaper to go to a hockey game in Switzerland than in Canada because of obviously the... <laughs> It's not, it's, it, it, it's, the league is not at the same elite level, um, but it's a public building. And we've always been very, very interested in public buildings. I mean, you know, the 99%, I think a lot of the 99% don't need architects. Yeah, they need politicians, lawyers, they need uh, the means uh, with which to uh, empower, they need means with which to empower themselves and, and, and to do things themselves. I'm, I, I've always been very, very reluctant to work outside of Western Europe. We've never worked outside of Western Europe uh, because it always feels like a kind of colonialism and it feels like, it feels um, patronizing, you know, to, to think that I would know what to do in China, let's say. You know, we've been asked a, a, a number of times, but I, you know, I have no knowledge no kind of depth of knowledge of the situation there. There's other reasons, maybe I don't want to work there also, but just in terms of culture, I'm, I'm too alien to that culture. Whereas Western Europe, it's, 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 it has a long history. Even when I was studying in McGill in North America, you know, the, the European tradition was one that, you know, that was the tradition that we were all looking at and, and aspiring to. But there has been a shift, I, I agree. Um, and that way of thinking about architecture and what's important and the value that I gave, that I have given for most of my career to the kind of cultural practice of architecture, I am starting to question it, you know? So I am looking for ways in which I can engage more directly with social things and, and, and that's what this renewal of modernism that I was talking about is about. So, okay, another thing I would say is, uh, we were talking before the lecture, I was talking, Carlos asked me a question that overlaps. I mean, uh, I, I said that I think that the overproduction of architecture, of buildings, of which architects are, you know, they're not only to blame for, but we're partially part of the, par partially to blame for. I think now it's part of the problem. You know, it's part of the problem in terms of uh, the kind of hegemony of capitalism. It's also part of the problem in terms of the consumption of, um, of finite resources. And so I really think ethically, I would like to be in a position where we're doing far, far fewer new buildings, perhaps no new buildings, and that we direct our energy to, uh, a uh, 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 constructive and a creative reuse of the existing building stock. I think that that is the main task of the architect today. And not only uh, restructuring of historic monuments or of good buildings, but also of quite lousy buildings. Um, and that's what I've been doing with my students over the last couple of years. I mean, I haven't done new buildings with my students in two or three years. And last semester, we purposefully looked at mediocre buildings because I think that's just another kind of elitist judgment. Oh, that's a shitty building. We demolish it and we'll put something much better there in the place. We can't afford to do that. You know, the embodied energy in a building, uh, you can't just demolish it. And then what do you do with the material when you've demolished it? You know, they, you put it in landfill or something. So 
It's maybe a bit of a boring answer, but I think that's one of the things we can do. I also think, and I think in Switzerland, it's interesting because architects are very involved on the client side of projects in Switzerland. They're very involved in, uh, in the city. Um, I think that a lot of my best students will not start conventional practices. They will try to start practices that are more about mediating between policy and building. Um, and I think that that's going to be a growing area for architects to get into. And I think that uh, you want really good architects to go into that. That shouldn't be a default career path for architects who are not good designers, who, you know, who are just good at the business end of things. I think the complete architect should also be taking on those tasks. And I, I would say five or six years ago, I would have answered that question very, very differently. So I've really changed my opinion about that. Thank you, Adam. Um, we have another relevant question here from Mac Pavlik, who says, uh, well, thanks so much for the lecture. In the first part, you spoke about the work of uh, Martha Rossier and Gordon Martha Clark in the 70s and their influence on the architecture. Uh, in your last semester at ETH, you also worked with a lot of artists and references from the art world. How do you see the interrelationship of the arts and architecture today? And how much do you think they influence each other? Question. I mean, uh, an interest in art, historical art and also contemporary art is something that really connects Peter Sinjin and I. Uh, you know, since we started our practice. I mean, we didn't go to school together. We're very different people. He's English, I'm Canadian, um, but we both love art. And we've always found a lot of inspiration. That sounds a bit lame, but we've got a lot of ideas from art. And I think at contemporary art, I mean, like architecture, a lot of contemporary art is terrible and kind of a waste of space but there are also really great artists working today. And I think artists are much freer and much quicker than architects. So they're able to articulate situations that we find ourselves confronted by, but they also are able to develop methodologies or ways of thinking or strategies that sometimes also have a relevance for architects. And so at the beginning of our practice, I showed you that photograph of the distillery in Clerkenwell. At the beginning of our pro practice, we were looking a lot at fine art photography. First of all, we were looking at American photographers like Lee Friedlander, and then German photographers like Strutt and Gursky and Hoffer. Um, we've, because we have this connection with the art world, which we kind of made, we've done a lot of collaborations with artists, in particular, Thomas Demand, a German artist who we're building a building with now, but we've designed a lot of exhibitions with him. Um, I think, you know, artists are incredibly intelligent agents in society. They're able to make work which is critical, but then because they have much more autonomy than architects, they're able to make work that is much more relevant and much more responds much more quickly to what we see around us. You know, I think, you know, we'd be much better off if we had more artists in government and a lot less bankers. I mean, I find it crazy that bankers are so popular amongst politicians, given that the banking industry must be one of the catastrophes of the contemporary world, you know, just think about it. But artists, I think, the way they think, the value that they give to intuitive thinking, I think it's very, very powerful. I mean, in my teaching, I use it as a, kind of in an instrumental way. So we pick artists who are looking at very particular issues, but also who work in very particular ways. And the, in a way, it's a way of uh, the students engaging quickly, but very, very deeply in the practice of an artist who they probably have never heard of before, but who, whose work describes a kind of world. And we've chosen those artists because we think that world is a useful one. It's a useful filter to look at the situation of the semester. Uh, that's why we use it. That said, the coming, the semester that I had a two and a half hour meeting preparing with my, uh, with my co-teachers this morning, uh, we're not choosing artists as references. What we're choosing are small uh, 
kind of alternative societies, those are going to be the references that we work with. So we do change, you know, we used to use buildings as references. So, yeah. Thank you, Adam. Um, we are over time, but uh, abusing of your generosity, do we have time for a couple of extra questions? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. It's Thanks fine. so much. <laughs> uh, well, we have one from David Lavender. Uh, he says the existing context and the design uh, are both complex. Please comment on how premeditated design and interaction with the existing context proceed through the design and construction process? That's a very good question. All the questions are very good. So when I teach and I use references, and of course, when I started to use references in teaching, it was done in a loose way. And then it became more and more um, defined as a didactic tool because I'm teaching, you know, so I think it's fair enough to be didactic. But when Peter and I use references for our projects in the office, and it's not, the references don't all come from Peter and I, I mean, one of the only ways you can last, you can continue to do work that has any interest in it over a period of 30 years is to have amazing collaborators who have amazing libraries in the books, but also in their heads. Um, when we are working on a competition, references are the way we talk about the project. Um, but in some competitions, Petitions, they're very explicit, so that we have very specific references which we think are somehow relevant to the project. But the relevance might only be discernible to us. So the way in which you use the reference or even choose the reference is completely intuitive. There's nothing scientific or rational about it. But also there's other projects where we don't use references, where the project sort of just happens. There's other ideas that are maybe more conceptual. Lately, we've been doing a series of projects that have much more to do with the plan, something I never was very interested in, but I've become much more interested in in the last few years. Um, and it's the plan and the way the plan and the construction relate to each other. But of course, deep down, there's also some connection to the site, you know? But I would say that, all, that, that it's a kind of constellation of the reference, the program, and the program is the functional program, but it's also your client. It's also the social situation around the project, which is more than just your client. The idea of references, all of those things, I think, are brought into play in a very intuitive way. There's nothing scientific. It's different on every project. You know, we have ways of compiling and putting up the references, just to make it quicker, but it's totally different in every project. And actually every year that one practices, it becomes even more intuitive. And the range of references that you can use become broader because you figure out how to use a reference that you never thought was possible to use or never seemed relevant. So I guess the important thing is you have to be really interested in a lot of things. You have to keep on looking at things. Because that's the other thing is that the pool of references was not fixed 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Yeah, it's ongoing. Um, Excellent. Excellent uh, answer. Um, I would just add that perhaps that which you call intuition may refer to a poetic strategy and is uh, the metaphor or metamorphosis. It's like you choose things because they come to place, because, because there is this subtle connection the 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 moment the moment of creation is like the perfect crime you you, you really cannot explain it totally but also intuition i think in modern in contemporary culture intuition has been um undervalued um, or yeah. undervalued intuition is maybe the most powerful form of intelligence scientists work with intuition they don't work rationally yeah. of course they have methods which are rational but they work intuitively and the great leaps in science are moments of pure intuition it's about making a connection where nobody ever saw a connection before okay in architecture the leaps are less significant than that but it's a for me it's a powerful form of intelligence and yes the way you describe it carlos it's that moment but it's not a single moment like i'm 
very against the idea of the origin sketch. I refuse to look at my student sketches. I have no interest. I barely trust my own sketches. I have no faith in my student sketches. I want to see a model or a drawing that's already been worked on where they can really, in a developed way, talk to me about the relationship of ideas, maybe of a reference and of the project. And yes, you, I think you need many of those moments to develop a project. It's not just one. Good. Uh, two more questions to yeah, finish. Sure. Yeah. One uh, from Ted Landrum, who asks, uh, can you speak of the retro first campaign in the UK and how your material research on masonry work, line-based masonry can be or has been part of your analog architecture in teaching? I don't know, the, I don't know the movement. I mean, of course, I've, I know about and have written about analog architecture. I mean, you know, Peter and I really love old buildings, you know, and that's, uh, it, that's a kind of requirement if you're going to build in the European city, you know, and I think that's a real problem a lot of contemporary architects have is that they don't love old buildings. They think they're just old, especially the generations before me, like the big generation of British architects who are all lords now, I think they really don't understand old buildings. Peter and I love them and we love them not necessarily because of what they symbolize, because sometimes what they symbolize is problematic, but we love them because they have an incredible atmosphere. They have a residue of their history, so they might have been built for one reason, but then they've had many, many other uses and those residues are somehow evident in the building today. The way we look at historic buildings is we look at them as contemporary buildings. They're part of the contemporary world. And part of our interest in older buildings is the way they're built, because actually on, in really good old buildings, you know, you don't have any of the excuses that, oh, the contractor was shitty. We didn't have enough of a budget. Somehow they all seem to be built very, very well, even if they're built simply. And that is, you know, a, a way that we measure the way we build also. And when you look very, very closely at historic buildings, you some of the techniques are of no relevance at all today because one has to accept layered construction today because we're trying to make buildings which are airtight, which are highly insulated, but we're also trying to use make buildings whose weight is part of the kind of moderating uh, instrument of the interior, you know, and there's some contradictions in modern layered construction. And so in the last couple of years, we've been doing a lot of research on timber structures because I think timber, using timber, not only is it zero carbon, it's actually a carbon sink. So you're reducing the amount of carbon in the environment because of the growing trees. And we're also doing a number of projects with load bearing stone walls because stone, if you're using an active quarry, which is near your site, that also has virtually zero gray energy in it. And so there are these kind of technical and political issues, but for us, they're always connected also to more cultural or formal or atmospheric issues. And that's the kind of way we negotiate our way through things. And because every year the issues and the priorities change and every project have a different hierarchy of issues, um, you have to be responsive, you know? If you are not an architect, if you're an architect who doesn't like to repeat themselves very much. I mean, Peter and I are, rather impatient in that way. We don't, we get bored quite easily. We don't really like repeating ourselves very much, which is of course a very good motivation for continuing to learn, which for me is the only reason to be an architect is because you learn things when you do a project. It's very complicated and you learn a lot technically, socially, small p politically. Um, that's the only reason you would go through the hell of making a building. <laughs> no other justification. Yeah, we have a one last uh, question, and okay. it's in a way is is in continuity uh, with regards to the previous one. It's from Michael Meyer. Michael asks, "Your work is uh, very monumental. Lots of heavy materials and bold atmosphere." How do you feel about wooden architecture buildings for the future? 
I often struggle a little bit with minergy, minergy, like mining, yeah. but building everything in concrete and CO2 high exhalation. So how do you work towards this new way of building environmentally friendly? Well, I sort of answered that already, but I mean, yeah. I wouldn't agree our buildings are monumental. Yes, we use, we, we haven't done any all glass buildings, that's true. Um, We've designed some all timber buildings from the beginning of our practice. Um, we've always been interested in timber. I mean, I am from Canada at McGill, you know, until the final year, most of the projects we did were timber frame buildings. So it's kind of a cultural, something you, you, you take with you. Um, now I would say all of our major projects, the, the assumption is that we're gonna build them with a timber structure. Uh, because I think you cannot justify using in situ concrete now. And it's amazing in Switzerland, where three years ago they changed the fire regulations, which all of a sudden changed the bias from concrete construction to timber becoming very possible. And also within three years, the, the timber industry developed incredibly. And I expect in a year or two, the cost will be the same. So now there's still about a 10% uh, it's 10% more expensive to build with timber. Um, so that is our default. We just won a competition recently for a building right in the center of Zurich to replace really an unusable 1980s building. The structure was unusable. We're, we're reusing the basement of the existing building and then we're building a timber structure above it, an eight story building. We're using load bearing stone from the Swiss Italian border on the street facade and the rear courtyard facade is timber, coated timber. So I'm totally committed to it. I think lots of old buildings had timber structures and masonry facades. I think when you're building in the countryside, you can also have timber facades, that's obvious. But I think in the city, there's very few cities where you can really have a timber facade. I think that's a problem. Um, culturally and in terms of longevity and all of those things. But I don't agree that our buildings are monumental. You know, I think some of them are have a monumentality, but a building like Walsall, which is a big building whose structure is in situ concrete, so it's a big building, but the, the terracotta shingles, which are enormous, which hang off the facades of that like feathers at the scale of a 35 meter high building. I think many of our buildings have moments of incredible lightness as well. And um, maybe not literal lightness, but a kind of an atmosphere of lightness. And I'm as interested in lightness as I am in heaviness. And for me, it's about doing something which is relevant and appropriate. And, you know, I, there's nothing I hate more than um, um, pompous buildings. I hate pomposity that that is I really don't like it in people and in buildings I don't like it <laughs> and I hope we have largely avoided that thank you Adam uh, I think I would conclude uh, counter arguing to you in a in a I hope in a kind way and but, uh, I think that your best work is monumental in the best sense of the word which has nothing to do with liveness or the material that you use Monumentality in reality comes from making something memorable. And if yeah. your building is memorable to the people that inhabit the building, then it becomes monumental. I re I, I'm reminded of Paulo Mendes da Rocha when at McGill, he was invited and he received the same question. You know, it's like, but your buildings are monumental and there's this idea about the monumental is wrong or there's something bad about monumentality. And he said it even, even more interestingly. He said, well, we are monumental if, if people remember us. Human beings, we are the monumental ones. And, and uh, in a way, uh, uh, I, I see those almost, uh, if you say, uh, timeless qualities in the architecture that you attempt that have to do with uh, with the buildings being for the people, for for meaningful experience, for 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 collecting, for recollection in the best sense of the word, without being 
uh, pastiche or without being, uh, let's say, stylistically uh, frivolous, uh, is, is, is an experimentation, but it's a building that in the end accomplishes the most essential functions of, of any urban architecture in your case, and it's like being civic. So thank yeah. you very much, uh, Adam. Uh, it has been <laughs> wonderful for us. Uh, a privilege, an honor, and delightful moment. And uh, without uh, anything else to say, because the time is up, um, I would like to thank everyone for for yeah. this uh, interest in 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 uh, the conversation with you and your lecture. And I hope it has been uh, as as enlightening as it has been for me. So thanks so much. Thank you for inviting me. It's very enjoyable. Yeah. Thank you all.